Greetings class, Professor Steve here with our final um, lesson in this unit. Uh, and so uh, what is, we talked about what sets up thermal handline circulation. Uh, you know, in our previous weeks we have led up to uh, organic matter cycling, the biological and physical, some of the physical processes and involved with, with organic matter cycling. Um, and, and so now we're going to talk about how sort of the, the these two sets, at least this large-scale ocean circulation, um, and those processes, uh, how they're affected by that. So first is these. We learn the setup of the uh, uh, the reason we say the ocean is stratified has two separate layers. Is the surface ocean is set up in a very specific way by physical interaction with the atmosphere, mostly right heating from the sun, um, fresh water from rain, and water and uh, terrestrial runoff and then that's all mixed together it's all stirred together into one well mixed fresh uh, warm layer we talked about how the ocean deep layer is set up by um, uh, the the, uh, the freezing of ice uh, makes the freezing of ice at the poles makes the water at the poles and the surface um, very salty which means it's more dense it's also very cold temperatures at the surface which makes it even more dense um, and so we get deep water sinking cold water sinking traveling the 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 length of the ocean so we have um, deep water formation that's how the deep layer is formed um, and it's so dense that it's very separate from the surface ocean but we have these instances where things collide or are driven surface word where they can then warm up become fresher and part of the surface ocean and then again be transported towards the poles where they become deep where a deep water formation happens again um, and that is the basis for what drives Oops, sorry, an extra slide in here showing just how this can be made up of very of many different water masses that form. Um, but that's that that um, pro those processes are essentially what what drives the largest scale pattern of ocean circulation that we call um, thermal handline circulation or the conveyor belt. And so that is at the at the poles, most specifically um, in the North Atlantic and along Antarctica, we have this deep water formation, right? Um, and then as you get closer to areas in the uh, areas that are closer to the equator or as you get to the Pacific, you have this surfacing, um, warming and freshening and then circulation at the surface back towards the poles to become to to do deep water formation again, right? So so um, transfer of cold water deep cold water towards the equator in the deep um, transfer of warm fresh water um, at the surface towards the poles, right? Thermal handline circulation, and that's what balances um, the majority of the global heat budget. But how do we get these patterns, right? We saw these these um, profiles of different different physical and chemical characteristics of the ocean, um, and we saw that in the surface is very different than in the deep. Um, and we have there these strong contrasts as we cross that barrier, as we go from surface to deep, we have these clines, right? We have the thermocline, um, which happens to coincide with the halocline, um, change in salt, the pycnocline, change in density, and any of the neutroclines. So the nutrients are always very different in the surface than they are in the, in the, in the deep water. And the answer to that, the, the reason that they are different and look the way they do, um, uh, the, the pieces to that puzzle you already know. We just have to sort of put them in context. Um, first, two of the driving mechanisms for a lot of the biological processes we talked about in biogeochemical cycling um, are very dependent on oxygen and CO2. Now these things, in cold water, gases diffuse more readily into cold water. So a lot of oxygen and a lot of CO2 gets trapped in this cold water in the deep water formation at both the North Atlantic and in the Antarctic. And once it's trapped and sinks, it has nowhere to go. It's stuck there. So, so this water has a lot of O2 and CO2, and both of those travel the sea floor with deep water formation, and then eventually will we'll come up and surface in certain areas. But that is why when we look at these profiles in oxygen, we'll, we'll explain the rest of this in the surface in a minute, but that's why this goes up, 
back up as we get into the deep, right? Because this is all o oxygen supplied from from the uh, from the deep water formation. So what about the rest? Okay, so let's take it one piece at a time. So if this was a nutrient profile, why are they so low all the way down here at the surface, and why are they so high in the deep? Well, we know the reason nutrients should be low in the in the surface, and that is due to autotrophy, due to primary productivity, right? These guys are autotrophs, they're plants, they need these nutrients. Also, many, many bacteria need the nutrients, like nitrate, phosphate, um, ammonia, and silicon, any nutrient you want to plug in here, iron, they're all going to be lowest up here where the um, activity is highest, right? And then it's in this mixed layer in the surface ocean closest to the sun that we get most of the autotrophy, most of the primary productivity. So they just suck these nutrients way, 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 way down. Okay, so that's the first characteristic. The nutrients are restored, so why do they get higher once we get out of the surface ocean? And that is because as you approach the bottom of the surface ocean, as you get towards the thermocline, <clears throat> you get less and less light, and you get a lot more consumption of the autotrophs. Right, so the autotrophs begin to get consumed by grazers, by the by um, by ciliates, by heterotrophic nanoflagellates. They begin to get consumed by um, by. It happens throughout the water column up here, but but down here the autotrophy begins to go down. So they're not sucking up as much as these nutrients. We've got copepods eating these guys. And so what they do is excrete, essentially, right? Everybody consumes these. Bacteria are eating the organic matter and, and, um, and excreting the nutrients back out. So they're pooping. And essentially it starts to add back these nutrients. Now once we get below the, the thermocline, um, where the light is very, very low, we get no autotrophy and nothing but heterotrophy. Okay? So we have by down here we have all this organic matter sinks into the deep ocean um, and only heterotrophs, almost all bacteria, once we get this deep in the water, bacteria or archaea, all prokaryotes, um, are consuming these guys, this organic matter that's sinking. As they consume it, they excrete nitrate, ammonia, um, phosphates, they excrete this stuff. So that's why it gets used up in the surface. Um, and then gets regenerated or restored at depth. So what about the oxygen? Well, oxygen is very high. When, nutrient, when nutrients are low in the surface, oxygen is very high. And why is that? It's highest at the surface because oxygen can diffuse in and out of the surface when it's close to the air, um, to the atmosphere. Um, but also, what do the autotrophs do? They're, they're, they are, they're doing photosynthesis. And what is one of the products of photosynthesis? Oxygen. So oxygen is always very high in the surface. And you see, as we get deeper and deeper, we get less and less photosynthesis as we get further and further away from the light. And so oxygen starts to go down because it's also being used up by these guys, right? The heterotrophs are starting to consume things, um, and the consumption is starting to outweigh the, pro the, uh, the primary production, and so oxygen begins to get used up, right? So oxygen's high up here from photosynthesis and from contact with the atmosphere. Now again, once you get below this area where there's no primary productivity, so you get out of the surface ocean and you're into this deep layer, there's no oxygen production, there's no photosynthesis, and there's no interaction with the atmosphere. And so the oxygen's used up very, very quickly, and it gets very, very low. Okay, And it stays low, and it gets used up very, um, very strongly until the organic matter that's sinking out begins to get all used up. And then this deep water formation down here restores some of the oxygen. Okay, So this, all the oxygen down here is entirely from deep water formation. No matter where you are in the ocean, the oxygen down here formed either in the North Atlantic or in the Antarctic when deep water formed. Okay, so thermohaline circulation actually brings the oxygen back. <coughs> so what we get, essentially, if you look at it in a picture, is we get deep water formation. As the water travels along the, the ocean, organisms Essentially, we get all the activity in the surface and throughout the water column that we talked about in the previous weeks. Right? We get organic matter formation, we get sinking, we get heterotrophic activity and excretion. Right? We get poop, which sinks and gets intermingled with this deep water formation. Right? That gets formed in the, let's say, let's take the North Atlantic as an example. As it travels, we get more of that activity that collects into that water. As it continues to travel, we get more of that activity that gets continues to accumulate. 
Okay, now where does this water ultimately end up? It drives from the North Atlantic all the way to the Pacific, where it surfaces again, and some, sometimes in the Indian Ocean, right? So the equator, towards the equator or in the Pacific, this water finally comes up and it's loaded with all these nutrients. And this is the reason for this, these profiles. Now, I don't need you to be responsible for all these, but here we have oxygen and CO2. Um, that's alkalinity, um, which I don't need you to know about, but pH is, is a measure of acidity, how acidic it is. But then the, so it's the oxygen and CO2 I want you to look at, and the nutrients. Here's phosphate, here's nitrite, here's silicon dioxide, which diatoms need. And if we look, the North Atlantic has more oxygen and less CO2 buildup. Less oxygen is used, more CO2, or less CO2 is build up, built up. And in the Atlantic, we have, um, in the deep water, we have much less nutrients, and right, much less of each one of these than we do in the Pacific, much more nutrients. And this diagram is the, is the explanation for that. So as this travels, it gathers more and more nutrients right through this process. More nutrients as it heads towards the Pacific, it gathers more nutrients. As it heads towards the Pacific, it gathers more nutrients. So essentially by the time the deep water reaches the Pacific, it's much, much older, right? It's been traveling for much, much longer, and it's accumulated way more nutrients, right? So the Atlantic is younger, hasn't accumulated as much nutrients. The Pacific is older, and it's, it's, a, it's accumulated a lot more nutrients. The things that use up the nutrients is the same reason, or the processes that use up nutrients is the same way we have the reason we have the oxygen profile, a much more extreme oxygen profile. The Atlantic has more oxygen because less of it's been used up because it's newer. And same thing with CO2. If it, oxygen's being used up, CO2 is being produced. So we have much less CO2 but much more oxygen in the, in the Atlantic. Now let's talk about this um, in terms of where where nutrients come from um, and how they're affected by, by this by the stratification of the ocean. Okay, so in a typical sense, um, or in the sense that we've talked about it so far, we have CO2 that comes into the ocean, we have nutrients. The nutrients are taken up by phytoplankton in primary production. The phytoplankton, or that fixed organic matter, is taken up by, heter by heterotrophic consumers. They excrete more nutrients and complete the circle, right? So we have all this cycling. This is what we call regenerated primary production. So this primary production is all due to the regeneration within this cycle, right? These guys are eaten, they regenerate through excretion and dying and breaking down and decomposing, and they, they create more nutrients for primary production to occur again. If anything from this ecosystem right here happens to sink into the deep ocean, right? These guys can stick together and sink, they can excrete, they can die and sink. Um, we can have marine snow and export from the ocean. These guys can be part of that process too, right? Um, so we have copepod, we have a fish, we have bacteria. All this stuff can contribute to sinking into the deep ocean. Now before it makes it to the sea floor, um, it becomes a deep organic matter pool which feeds deep prokaryotes. So if these prokaryotes take up this organic matter, they're also going to excrete and regenerate nutrients. But now they're removed from this surface system. Once they're removed from the surface system, their nutrients they regenerate can, in some instances, like in the Pacific, but in some other ins instances that we'll go over in a couple of lessons, in a couple of units, we get this reintroduction of the nutrients someplace else, another part of the ocean. When it's forced from the deep ocean to the surface ocean, we call that upwelling. Okay, this is a very important term. So when these nutrients are driven up, they are into the surface area where we can have primary production, and of course they do feed primary production. When we have nutrients from a totally different part of the ocean driven up in upwelling, it's not regenerated within the same system, we call that new primary production. Okay, So if the nutrients are cycled within an ecosystem and driving primary production, it's called regenerated primary production. If it's introduced through upwelling or some other um, phenomenon driving primary production somewhere else, it's called new primary production. And it's in this 
um, new primary production that will draw new CO2 into the ocean and turn it into phytoplankton. And of course the whole thing can cycle within itself. Thanks for joining me guys. See you next lesson.